So uh, first things first, why? Why this book? Why now? Why you two together? I'll answer the first two. Susan can answer the third question. So um, <laughs> the uh, questions got harder as they, as they went forward. Uh, let me just do this. Uh, there's a lot that can be said on the subject. Uh, maybe the best way to summarize it is obviously there's a lot of demand in cities, a lot of issues in cities, the problems exceed the resources. Um, the government cannot continue to operate the way it does. It's just it's not effective enough. Second is the, the congruence of all the technology breakthroughs. I mean, I tried to create a data analytics center in New York City three years ago and couldn't get it funded because it was too risky, right? So if, if you, it, just in the, in the last 24 months alone, the data mining tools and the cloud sophistication along with the ubiquity of the handheld tools and the like just make that a particularly interesting time. So, so what we, and then third, uh, what many of you in the room represent, right, is that, the, that the, uh, the velocity of activity from the civic app groups and, and the value they've produced suggests that our old uh, kind of lines between public and private and public and civic and what government does and what the community does, those are all outdated as well. So the, the reason the book now is because there's an opportunity to rethink and reorganize government in a pretty uh, a, a transformative way to incorporate the power and energy in the community in order to produce better services uh, uh, with available resources. And there's even more to be said about that. So the, um, I spent a lot of time on the international level, on internet policy and the federal level, and cities and technology provide us with the most exciting opportunities we've seen in 100 years to thicken the mesh of civic engagement, using this electronic layer of our poorer lives, to make government truly responsive to citizens, to actually bring, bring to reality the dream of the internet, which is that we will be a global village, we'll care about each other, we'll interact with each other in ways that are uh, genuinely human and responsive. We can now do that at a city level, and people love their cities. So Steve knows everything about cities. I have been newer to this topic, and I've really enjoyed talking to people in City Hall. There are a lot of heroes out there. The book is kind of a people magazine of the sort of civic tech movement field, um, with the big case studies of Chicago and Boston and New York, and the stories that are present, the things that people are doing are really exciting. You have to buy the book to really learn about that. But. I'm happy to reel out some of the stories as we answer your questions tonight. But why now? Because cities are the places where democracy works, where people feel a sense of autonomy and agency, and where uh, fearless mayors and brave staff are doing their very best to bring those dreams into reality. Excellent. So what I heard there is that Steve knows everything about cities. So the bar is very high now yeah. for the rest of this conversation. <laughs> Steve does know it. Really, what, but, but if you listen closely to what Susan said, it's, Steve knows everything about the way things used to be, and I know a lot about the way things should be, which is why we wrote the book together. Excellent. Uh, so one of the things, speaking of people who know cities, on the back cover here, you see some really interesting names. You see Rahm Emanuel, Newt Gingrich, Ed Rendell, Mike Pence, and Jen Palka, all on the same back cover endorsing this book. Those are names that you do not see together agreeing on too many things. So do you think that uh, this data-fueled governance, this new approach to how cities can operate, is, is, is this an issue that we're actually going to be able to see some agreement from a diverse uh, array of political uh, and governmental figures? Well, Susan worked in a Democrat White House. I worked in a Republican one, right? And uh, I work now with uh, mayors of top 30 cities of different political parties. We've made every effort in the book to avoid kind of political polemics, right? The, the, theory, the, the, the way I think about it, and I think the way we think about it, but Susan can speak for herself, is that um, you can argue about whether government's spending too much money or not enough money, right? You can argue about whether taxes are too high or taxes are too low. But we should be able to have some uh, congruence here that whatever money government spends at least ought to spend it well, and it ought to spend it in a way that leverages civic and community and personal participation. Right? So, so if, if your uh, overarching goals are inequality or inequity, then 
we ought to use whatever dollars we're spending to uh, inside the, this network of resources to, to, to do it well. And whether you're identifying outliers, you're evaluating what works, you're engaging the community through social media, the pro basic proposition is there should be agreement that effect in this matters, regardless of kind of which side of the ledger you're on. And, and finally, I just, you know, I've been in local government for like three decades. I like local government because most folks at the local government level are pragmatists, right? That they have to get something done, and there provides an opportunity for a lot of overlapping interests. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. At a time when, especially at the federal level, everything's corrosive and polarized and miserable, every mayor just has to get things done every day and clean the streets and see the effect of what he does on, on his people. So this is a thoroughly bipartisan issue. I, I, a government needs to work better so that the model survives and remains relevant and so that it's all of us uh, get the services and assistance we need. So um, that's why all these people agree on this book, because it, we're right. <laughs> <laughs> you can answer the next question first. No, well, so you take it. Okay. Those are the best kinds. So, uh, <laughs> but the, but the, the names on the back of the book were intentionally designed to be equal, number from party and vantage point of perspective, right. and it, it, there was some intentionality in the way we did that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's some pretty pretty impressive names. Uh, so one thing about a field like this is it's still nascent. It's, it's still coming into its own. And uh, words matter a lot. And right now, there are a whole lot of words and phrases that, that we all use to describe what it is uh, that, that you're working on, that these mayors are doing. So when you think about whether, whether it's civic tech or civic innovation, civic engagement, issues of governance versus government, participatory and open, smart, wired connections, what are the words that you like? Are there words that you actually avoid using? Are there phrases that you feel do not represent well uh, the issues that you're trying to address in the book? Well, I'll do the half the words. Um, let me start with a kind of construct, right, which is um, the really important issues in our communities are not going to be solved in one sector, and they're not going to be solved with government deciding what's in somebody's best interest, right? They're going, to be, they're going to be resolved through true partnerships. And one way to think about this, right, is uh, uh, I've spent 30 years working with uh, uh, kids in the child welfare system, abused kids, right? Those kids live in a system. They don't live in the welfare department, right? They don't live in the schools. They don't live in the health department. They may live in a neighborhood, but all of those actors affect what happens in their lives. Their friends do, right? They're, uh, the, the adult that they live with does. And, and so as we think about this effort, we, we've been thinking about uh, it in a couple of ways. One, I like governance better than government because the role in my sector ought to be how to engage with the other sectors. It shouldn't be how to tell people what to do. And I'm not talking about a, a minimalist form of government. I'm talking about a government that is respectful and humble about the fact there's a lot of information out there. And, and even the, the, you know, the, the Boston apps that we talk about in the book, start as better ways to complain to your government, right? There are much more sophisticated ways to complain to your government, but that really isn't the essence of citizenship that we're thinking about. It's a government that, that partners, right, that solves problems together, that looks at the system. So I like governance better than government. I like effectiveness better than efficiency, because efficiency has that kind of feel like, mm -hmm. well, if we just spend less money and do things a little bit worse, that, that you know, or maybe even spend less money and do it the same, that that's, but, but we're talking about effective delivery of services inside the system. And then finally, um, uh, the, um, I think the open data civic engagement movements uh, are important because um, we want to create a sense of, I don't want to use crowdsourcing so kind of overused, but I want to, we want to source the solution in an iterative way to these important problems. So that's why I've been more sensitive to kind of governance, government by network, Civic technology and uh, engaged citizenship than we are the, than I am the other set of words. Yeah, no, I agree with all that. And also, um, using smart implies that some cities are dumb. So, uh, responsive was a very deliberate choice for the title of this book. That this is interactive, experimental. Sometimes cities should be allowed to f fail in small ways and learn from what their, their mistakes, change their behavior, switch directions. And to be agile was also part of this. Uh, not to dictate uh, solutions from the top down always, but to be listening to people as well. So for me, responsive is a really important word in all of this. 
Um, but I'm, I'm absolutely with Steve on the governance versus government and on the co-production of, of solutions. The field needs a name, though. We need a moniker, guys, mm -hmm. because civic tech doesn't capture it. Open gov, no, that's not it. So I'm all for responsive government. You know, we're happy to claim that this is the governance, that this is the, the buzzword. But we, we need better labels because people have trouble hanging on to this. Mm -hmm. Good points, uh, and I have to say I agree with a lot of them. And also, the reason that this, this new group exists at Microsoft uh, over the last six months is because we agree with uh, something Steve said at the beginning there, which is uh, cross-sector solutions to cross-sector problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so in the book, Chapter 6 focuses very much on um, a New York story, on the story of Mike Flowers and his team, a small band, doing data analytics before it was cool. Um, and, and getting results and show it really leading the way. Um, could you guys tell the, the folks in the crowd who might not have been exposed to that story a little bit about it? Well, well let me set this story up. Susan interviewed Mike for the book, and I, and I worked with Mike, so let me, I'll, I'll do the first part and then she can do the second. So some of you, uh, or maybe most of you, know the, the origin of this. So you know, we, we, let me back up for the, actually go forward and then go backwards. So Chicago is building with Mayor Emanuel a data analytics center where he's using data to, and, and will combine that with a, with a, uh, a reconceptualization of 311 about how data is used in the system. New York City, as Susan wrote in the book, primarily wrote in the book, is a skunk works with a, lot of, with, a, with a group of really smart people doing really cool things. Now they're, they're very different models. So. Now we'll go back to the beginning. So I'm sitting in City Hall as deputy mayor, and uh, we find out that a family died in a fire from one of those illegally converted buildings, right, where too many families are in the same building. And, and you know, I, I can anticipate what's going to happen. The Post and the news are going to uh, call and find out how many times the fire buildings department have received complaints about that building. It's just kind of like in, if you're in city government and there's a disaster, then. You know, it has multiple layers to it. So I call each of the departments and say, you know, have you got any complaints? And they both say, yeah, we've actually got complaints about that building. And we, you know, we may or may not stop out there, but we have thirty to 50,000 complaints a year, and we're doing our best to get through them. So point one in the story, and Susan will provide the kind of the ending, which is pretty exciting, is, the, is that government manufactures widgets the same way every day. And they're de often the definition of performance is how quickly you perform these set of activities, not where the activities actually produce any results. So, um, so you know, we everybody uh, is kind of gnashing their teeth trying to figure out the answer to these problems, and we create a little task force. And then Mike is in the back of the city hall room doing I whatever. I never really quite figured out what he did, but it was something he didn't want to tell anybody about. I think probably. And and so he says, "Give me sixty days." And I'll come back with an answer. And now Susan will tell you how I did it. And, 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 but it's important to point out, it's not big data. It's not $10 million. It's not hiring the big uh, integrators to do the work. It's, uh, it's two or three really committed people who solve a problem in a pretty interesting way. Right, and Mike Flowers is, is a very interesting guy who had been in Iraq uh, working on intel, basically, and saw New York City government as essentially tribal that there were fiefdoms, they were hanging on to things, they were going to go after him. And so he had no real authority, but decided that marrying uh, databases together um, and using a whole bunch of different sets of information from inside City Hall might help in looking for leading indicators of risk of fire, right? And it's remarkable how difficult this is to do, but Mike walk, walks around persuading people, people in the tribes with his little thumb drive to give him data, and he promises that he will deliver something that will be of value to them. He adds together these databases, looks for leading indicators, and then sees that if you uh, combine maybe five different factors from different sets of the world, that you can increase the uh, predictive power of your um, uh, inspections by a thousandfold. You know, and he says, look, of course we did better by looking for leading indicators. You know, moving from irrationality to rationality is always going to help. So he sees this as very primitive stuff. But he did it as an entrepreneur inside City Hall. And uh, one of the things we write about is the power of data to help public employees have more discretion in their jobs. 
to be treated as professionals, to see the context for what they're doing, rather than being stuck in rote mechanical jobs. So Mike is an example of guts and fearlessness and um, you know sort of bravery, but he's also an example of a new flavor of public employee. And we're seeing more and more of these people, and we wrote the book to encourage them to have them feel that they're not alone. Now that's that's a pretty amazing story from from. Yeah, and then the, I mean the the, the the really interesting kind of conclusion that Susan set up is right. Then so okay, now you've got three hundred uh, buildings. You don't have thirty thousand buildings. Right. And you set up teams of workers, and you give them discretion. You put the fire guy with the buildings guy with whomever else, and they go knock on the door, and they've solved the problem, right? Either they take some of the families out that shouldn't be there, or they put in sprinklers, or they cite the slum lord for whatever the problem would be, or they stop the crack factory, whatever the case may be, right? And they resolve the issue. So, and so, and that's the way government should operate with respect to kids who are in trouble, or water pipes that are going to break. And then, if you think about how massively you can rearrange the existing resources, then you have more money actually to solve real problems or you're being much more effective in the solution of those problems. Yeah, it's a great point. You always have finite resources and the ability to better apportion them is very important. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's an example from recent years. Yeah. Um, Steve, as mayor of Indianapolis in the 90s, did you see, uh, maybe not the same exact type of work, but other data-driven solutions? Or do you see that as something that's actually a much more recent phenomenon? Well, one part of it, uh, I'm maybe the oldest person in the room. One, one, one part of this isn't so new, I think, and one part is new. So um, I started my uh, public service career at the Midwest. Prosecutors are, are the collect child support. And so um, we were every AFD, every, every welfare mom in Indianapolis was my client, essentially, because we tried to collect child support for her. And just with simple data mining tools at the time, you know, because they were all simplistic. Collections went from 900000 to $40 million, right? Same number of employees. So then, moms started calling in asking about their cases, because they now were getting money, right? So uh, we couldn't keep up with the phone. So, I, so at the time, this is like in the dark ages for this room, there was some Infobot that would answer the phone. You put in your social security number, and they could tell you whether the check had been received, when your next court date was, or like kind of ten things from a menu. So then, at the time, the 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 prevailing wisdom, and I mean the prevailing wisdom from kind of liberals, not as well as conservatives, was well, these are welfare moms, and they're not comfortable with technology, and they really need to talk to somebody, and so this won't work. And basically, the message was. They'll satisfy themselves with poor public services, so let's not innovate for their benefit. It was, it, you know, nobody meant it like that, but it was pretty degrading language. Well, we went ahead and did it, on the, and on day one, 6,000 phone calls, right? Put in the Social Security number, find out the next court date. So that was like 20 years ago, really, honestly. But the, but the, but the factors that are relevant today, we have all the more powerful tools, but the combination of data and respect for the um, citizen, respect for the resident, right, and, and and personalizing the tools and using the community makes a big difference. So now you get to New York, and um, good news and bad news, and you're very sophisticated. You got a mayor, uh, well, actually this mayor and the last mayor care a lot about technology. Um, you know, massively new changes. The civic app, big app community, and, and hackathons and the like are really active in New York City. That's all good. Problem is, however. That, that we have employees now who, inside government, are trapped in very narrow, discretionless boxes, right? There's 2,000 job classifications, 200 unions, hierarchical levels of command and control, definition of professionalism, which is kind of like, I'll, I'll, I know what's best, I don't have to listen to the community. I, and I'm, I'm not criticizing the mayors or the, their government, it's just the way the government's structured here makes it very difficult to innovate in this way. So the difference, I think, over time is the tools are much more powerful. The ubiquity of the handhelds is, is dramatically, you know, the ability to mine data and not have to integrate these big databases, big chains, civic app world and the open app and the open data all are big differences. But in the end, if your employees have no discretion, it won't make any difference how much information you have. So there's been big changes, but not so big changes. Excellent point. Excellent point on the, the issue of uh, not just technological innovation, but also yeah process or cultural innovation. Um, so Susan, moving on to you, you, uh, you've spoken a lot, you've written a lot about the importance of connectivity. 
-hmm. and um, especially dark fiber. I think it was at the Personal Democracy Forum this year. Mm -hmm. um, you were on stage uh, giving a fantastic, um, to the point, um, uh, passionate plea. Uh, so what do you think of the efforts here in New York and elsewhere? What do you see being done on those issues of connectivity? <laughs> well, this issue is becoming front and center right now. So a bunch of big cities around the country are trying to figure out how to move forward. Because, So I went to the Code for America Summit uh, in San Francisco. 900 people, all very excited about the possibilities of technology, all of them assuming a stable, resilient, unlimited network that actually doesn't exist in the United States. Far too expensive, far too rare. So the substrate for absolutely everything we're excited about is universal fiber connectivity and uh, not having to worry about the cost of it when you're walking around the street. So in Stockholm, just want to let you know, you can get gigabit access for 20 bucks a month, just let, let you know. And um, we had a wonderful meeting earlier this morning with a bunch of civic tech leaders and a bunch of fiber leaders, seeing the connections between their worlds and really excited about uh, the possibilities with screens everywhere, you know, uh, being able to communicate w with real richness. Cities in America are right now moving forward on this. On Monday, there's a launch of a new initiative called Next uh, 21st Century Cities. It's going to be in um, Santa Monica. And there, there are many mayors getting together to talk about the importance of uh, fiber as an economic matter, cultural, social, and, and for government. Government can save a lot of money by not having to pay high rents to incumbents. So all of these things weave together. There is a multi-layered system. And the bottom of it, just as the street grid is essential to a city and electricity and clean water, so too connectivity. Good point. Um, so we live in the era of, of data. Uh, should people be scared of how their data is being used or could be used? Let me do that. <laughs> yes. So. Um, uh, look, I think that you know, th there are more than two sides to this question, right? So uh, one side would be uh, from those who are deeply committed to privacy that the chances of uh, abuse are significant and therefore we should lock down the data, right? And then there are others who say the chances of breakthroughs with the data are so great that we shouldn't have these rules. Um, so from my government perspective, right, my local and state government perspective, uh, it, it seems naive to take either one of those positions, right? We should say there are very serious and real privacy issues that are involved here when your government has access to data. And, the, and we should expect our local and state governments to set the rules, to have policies, to enforce those policies, to uh, make sure that we have anonymized data whenever we can when we're looking for large outliers, when we have a particular worker who needs access to the data, like a child welfare worker, what are the conditions under which he has that data, how long does it remain uh, resident in whatever particular device it is, uh, how do we monitor, Susan talks about kind of forensically monitoring these things, who inspects that stuff. So um, I, I believe that we don't have any choice but to take advantage of the data that's there. But similarly, to not have a policy or enforcement, or um, or rules about when data will be anonymized, how long it will be held, and whether it will be archived, and whether it will have personal identifiers, and all that stuff is. But you know, in the end, much of the work we're talking about can be done without personal identification, right? You, just in terms of kind of traffic flows and big issues in the city, and which water pipes are going to break, and, and 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 the like. But still, you could capture personal information if you wished. It's not that difficult to do, and we should have policies against it. Yeah, to the extent there's humor in answer to your question, I am simultaneously helping students work with Boston City Hall on civic projects and teaching the law of surveillance. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm right in the middle of this. And uh, we really need to deal with this policy issue, maybe through a set of principles. But right now, the two poles, as Steve describes, are uselessly far away from each other, and uh, nobody is taking on this issue with, with real strength. So I, I plead, I see some of my former students here, you guys, you better fix this and uh, take care of it, because my, I'm, I'm just teaching, I'm not going to fix this. <laughs> so, but it's, it's clearly essential, because there will be a big blowback that will cut off huge benefits for mankind, and the, the upside of all this is tremendous in terms of health and education and just reliability and usability of a city. 
unless everybody is so worried they wrap themselves in tinfoil and uh, try to you know, avoid data use. So data privacy is, is something that here at Microsoft uh, we care a lot about. It's something that the company, I think, has, has gotten some credit, um, especially relative to some peers in the industry, on, and it's something that, that we're always thinking about how we can do better. We've been focused, when I say this, I mean me and my team, we've been focused mostly domestically here in the United States, which I think also is, has been the focus of, of both of you. But, uh, but what about when you start thinking about uh, going overseas? Are the issues in an autocratic society um, the same as the ones here? Uh, have you spent much time thinking about those? Are the solutions going to be the same? Are the kinds of approaches that work in a major American city in a under a democratic uh, government the same as, as uh, in some thornier places overseas? I have some thoughts, but I'm going to defer to the professor of surveillance. <laughs> <laughs> that is a tough question. But so can I, I'm going to go up a few levels, which is that we have to demonstrate that democracy works well by doing small things well and making sure that we're using all this data in a way to help people's lives. You do that, and you're upfront about your policy making. You show your work. You talk about the principles that are governing you. You, as a, as a governance organization, punish the abuse of data. Uh, you make sure that you're looking at who has access to what. Then, long run, democrat democratic societies look better than the authoritarian ones. So the issues are different, and we have, I think, great hope in our system. We just have a way to go. It's a long term versus short term issue. Is, is there is there we're talking about, uh, about these policy conundrums that we're now facing? Yeah. Is there one uh, specific issue that you see as this is something that each society needs to figure out, or do you think it's more just a broad set uh, related to the use of data? Well, I think the, the the a huge problem is that we don't know what happens to a particular bit of data as it's being collected, and we have no idea how it could be combined with all kinds of other things in ways that would be, that would feel intrusive. Yeah, now we're in the future. Right, and so the, the, this question of being able to tag data forever so that you know its provenance and can understand its journey through its future, that seems like a, a big issue right now. So Indiana, for example, uh, building a huge management performance hub, big data analytics center, they're very serious about knowing where each piece of data has come from and understanding when they aggregate data what what it's been knit together from and that so they're really trying to solve this problem in an aggressive way mm -hmm. interesting yeah uh, so uh, I'm gonna ask you a, a question that I find kind of interesting I hope everyone else here does too uh, I'm gonna ask each of you to name three people that are doing really amazing work in this field and you get bonus points if you name people that we've never heard of <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to go first. So uh, Brenna Berman is the chief information officer of um, the city of Chicago. She is remarkable. She is, has a McKinsey background and a tech background. She's extremely deliberate and thorough and is thinking very hard about how to work with each city department on predictive analytics projects in ways that will benefit them, help them solve problems. And uh, she's the perfect person for that job. And I'm so impressed by her. She really is terrific. There's a new a uh, chief information officer in Boston, Ian Yasha Franklin Hodge, who uh, was Blue State Digital for the president in the last election, and is jumping into his new job with both feet and is extraordinary in his grasp of all the issues and a sort of gallows humor, which you also need in this job, <laughs> resilience. So I've been extremely impressed by him. And frankly, I'm impressed by Jen Polka and her uh, ability to, uh, the leader of Code for America, her ability to galvanize attention, draw in foundation funding, get a whole generation of people excited about working for government. I think she's extraordinary, too. It's a good list. We thought about uh, CIOs. I think yeah, Brenna would definitely be up there. Yeah. Bill Oates, who went from Boston to Massachusetts, oh. is really a terrific guy as well. And, and, we, and we like the work that uh, Paul Baltzell did yeah. in, in Indiana. If you think a bit uh, about the way we're conceptualizing this, um, it's it, it, there. There needs to be uh, activist intermediaries between government and underserved communities that help activate the under city underserved community that show them the data that can help them see what's happening in their community. And um, I think Dan O'Neill's Smart Chicago is very interesting. He's got a community uh, trust and MacArthur money and and. You know, one of the things about the open data movement 
is uh, sometimes the open data is ugly and unusable, except for sophisticated apps folks like many of whom are in the room, but for the average community group, they're not so. So somebody who takes that stuff and creates value and teaches folks how to, how to use it, I think, is, is, uh, is interesting um, a as well. So, um, and then, I mean, there's so many yeah. really interesting, um, uh, in, uh, in my world, the world, so many uh, new interesting app that are being done, you know, and, but I think I still go back to C Quick Fix and say that, you know, they, they continue to make a big, Ben continues to make a big difference, and that's a nice model for others to emulate. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. Well, with that, uh, why don't we open it up to questions in the room? Uh, so, anyone who wants to say something, I'll ask is uh, if I call on you, if you could stand up, tell everyone your name, um, ask the question, I will then repeat it so that we make sure that the video captures it, and then our, our wonderful panelists can, uh, can give you the answers. So yes. Thank you. Um, my question is, I mean, you were talking about partisan politics, so I think it was made of where you said there's no democratic or Republican way to collect trash. But when it comes to a change effort in governance, you know, you still have to face public servants, public opinion, and lots of politics. So in terms of changing the agencies from data silos to working together and so on, how generalized are the cases in the book? How applicable are they in other places? How can you actually use those? <coughs> How common are these individuals in government agencies? So the question is, how generalizable are the cases that you read about in the book? Well, well um, yeah, but he has like six questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me speak from the kind of government side. So the enemies of progress, the enemy of progress is the status quo, and it, it's the bureaucracy. And it's not that, it, and I've been a long time civil servant, so I, I, don't, I don't think it's because the people are bad, that they, they're in these activity-driven routines and very difficult to break out of it transformatively. They don't have the time, they don't have the resources, they don't have the tools. And so they, they tend to um, repel transformative changes. So that's one, that's one problem. The second problem is that, um, that the big opportunities are systemic opportunities. They're agency to agency and agency to community. And yet, the data is locked inside those verticals and not shared really uh, across the verticals, let alone with the community. And so, those are huge obstacles. And only and and then each one of those data sets is protected by platoons of lawyers, right? <laughs> who who explain why that data can't be uh, seen, accessed, used by anybody to add value. So, in order to so I think that the stories in our book are unusual. They're, they're a little bit early. But the, but the common theme in those stories is that there is some leader at the top that's willing to you know, break the glass, to make the difference, to advocate and protect the folks who are doing it, and some often respect for, um, uh, for, the, for the community as well. So I, I think there are a lot of barriers. And, uh, and uh, Susan, I think maybe a, 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 you tell the story about it, and I do, but, the, that's, but you know, how Mayor Menino, of all people, became a champion for uh, data is kind of an interesting response to the question. Right, right. Wait, the book speaks over and over again about the importance of leadership. So Mayor Tom Menino, been there for 20 years, known as Mayor Mumbles, had shaken the hand of half the people in Boston. Really didn't get technology at all, but was told that it might help him connect with even more people and help them understand the role of government in their lives. And, sort of make Boston a better place to live. So he just said, OK, let's go ahead, and hires the very first uh, uh, cabinet level chief information officer, Bill Oates, empowers his team, and keeps asking, how is this helping me connect with more people out there? That's the agenda they're given. And they feel a real sense of mission. And they drive forward, develop new apps, you know, buy a lot of machines. And they feel they increased civic trust in Boston so that at the time of the Boston Marathon bombing, they felt this sense of support from the citizens of Boston. And they felt that his technology agenda had a lot to do with that, that there was constant touch, constant outreach, constant sense of engagement. Um, one other thought, um, different subject, but same question, just different subject. Um, so the, when you want to change something inside government, right, the, the people who are against it know who they are, and they're really vested and very energetic. And the beneficiaries don't believe you or don't know who they are, right? It's just the nature of change. So another a way to flip your question on its head 
is to say that these virtual marches on City Hall, organized by data-driven intermediaries, right, who show folks the truth about whether their neighborhood is well served, whether their services are correct, you know, or, you know whether uh, there's a way to solve inequity in a particular community, whatever. That produces the dynamic for change that augments a leader who wants to, to do it, right? So, so I, I don't want to leave thinking that change has to be generated by the government. Gen some, often change is forced on the government, and that can happen through, uh, I mean, it just uh, kind of a last quick story. So, so here's the definition of community engagement if you're in local government. You decide what you want to do, and then you go to a community meeting where people will yell at you for four hours, and then you leave and do what you're going to do anyway, right? And you've, you have now had community engagement. Well, that's a pretty weird definition of community engagement when now we have this, you know, 70% adoption rates of smartphones and, and, and the social media tools when, if organized, can find be much better ways to express the demands for change or, or representation. And that, that example of community engagement, uh, good versus bad, I think was encapsulated perfectly in a few words that were repeated many times at the Code for America Summit, right. build with, not for. Mm. You're right. So engage people early in the process and actually have them be a part of the creation of the solution. Oh, that's uh, yes, let's go in the front row here. That's right. Uh, uh, thank you so much. This is a very interesting topic. Um, I'm curious, you know, we often hear about very amazing and visionary uh, stories about what technology and data can do for cities, for people, for science. What is a nightmare scenario? What are the oh, Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so the question was, uh, we often hear the, the uh, poly, no, that's, that's the right word, the very positive versions of what data can utopian. do for society. U yeah. Utopian versions utopian. of what can happen. Right. But what are some nightmare scenarios of what could happen? Well, what if the only way to communicate, either in, with, in connection with a service or in connection with a complaint or, or engagement, was a channel that wasn't functioning and wasn't being listened to? That's the nightmare. That's actually worse than introducing technology in the first place, because you've you've held out the promise of autonomy, agency, and response, and then it doesn't function. That's the, that would be the worst. Great. Let's go right over here. Hi, um, my name is Ben Wellington. Uh, I write a I write a little blog in New York. It's called Icon New York, and I look at sort of local data issues. And what I found is that um, I pointed out some things to agencies like. You know, there's some great inflation in health inspection scores, and, and uh, you can't get an even balance in your metro card. And these agencies have responded with these basic press statements that kind of have no content. And you know, sometimes you feel you have nowhere to go from there. Uh, mm -hmm. It feels very like, a, and sometimes there's a dialogue, but sometimes it's just it feels antagonistic when you're not. It's not supposed to be. What would you say government can do to change that? I mean, I thought about maybe an open data liaison embedded in agencies. What would be your like concrete recommendations to uh, to a government to fix problems like that? This is such a problem. I mean, everywhere. I mean, it's really, this is the problem. So, you know, I, one day I decided that um, I had this, like, two what I thought were really good ideas in New York City mayor's office at the same time. One is I'd actually listen to my employees, and the other is I would listen to citizens. So I created a little kind of online suggestion box. It was some more sophisticated software than that, but for sourcing and, and, and grading and kind of gamifying this. The, and, I, and I also then put an icon on uh, the city's website at the time saying to any, any resident of New York City, you have an idea for us, right? So the, first of all, the employees didn't respond very much because they were fearful their supervisors would get mad at them. Mm -hmm. I got 2,000 suggestions in the first week from New Yorkers about how their communities could be better. So then I organized them and sent them out to the agencies. Then I waited about two weeks and asked the agency, no, they were not, I mean, you know, thank you very much, we've received your suggestion, we're looking into it, see you in a couple of years sort of thing, right, in the last sentence. So, um, and, and the, the worst thing, I mean, one night, one answer, not how you intended the question, but one answer to kind of nightmare situation is you create the expectations that something will happen through engagement and then nothing happens. I don't think that you can that you can solve your problem unless there's some it, unless two things happen. One, the agency head or the mayor grades the the, the responsiveness of the de department. In some ways, like mayor grades do in D.C. And second, that there are ombudsmen or liaisons who sit in those departments whose job it is to respond and and vet each one of those and respond to it. And if there isn't. They won't. They, it just won't happen. It just it can't get done. And 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 they act as kind of an intermediary and, and solve those problems. And I think in New York City, the way New York City's government is organized, I think 
Mayor de Blasio has done this nicely. He's got all the data work is in the operations department in, in City Hall. It was a little bit more decentralized, if you will, under Mayor Bloomberg. And that would be a great place for that, uh, for that to own the solution to those problems. It's a really big, really big problem. Jason, yes. Hi, uh, Jason Wittett. Um, first of all, I, I love your vision for the future of, of cities. Uh, in making them a reality, it seems like there's two big issues. One is access to rights away, and the other is procurement laws. And I think you've tackled uh, access with your work with uh, municipal uh, electric companies and things like that. But with procurement, do you have any thoughts on how cities can get access to the right companies, whether they're startups or whoever, to help them put these solutions in place? Yes, the, the question the questions about uh, procurement, procurement rules, procurement yeah. laws, and what, uh, what solutions cities can use to get access to the best That's solutions. Awesome. Yeah, these questions go from like bad to worse. <laughs> <laughs> we asked what the nightmare scenario was, and we got two kind of minor examples of that. So, well, the, the, um, uh, when I first came to New York, I had expected to be here two years. I actually wasn't here full two years, but I expected to be here two years. And, to, and for a big procurement in New York City, at the time I started, the award would have been made. I had a two year sabbatical from Harvard to come down here after I went back to Harvard, right? That I could not procure in the time I had allotted through the existing system. So, um, and the rule-driven, prescriptive nature of uh, procurement is the enemy of innovation. Um, so it's very difficult. The laws need to be reformed. But one way to do it is there is a uh, project that uh, now under underway in Philadelphia, um, where essentially the, the the city has asked for. Uh, suggestions from its its uh, local technology, not so much local, but, but primarily local technology group has kind of pre-qualified those in terms of procurement, has picked the best of those, and then as they, you know, they, they get like 10,000, not very much money for to develop, but then if they win, right, if, then, then the city can fund them because they're already pre-qualified in the procurement process. So I think we need to find much better ways to, uh, because um, there's a lot of power in small developers and, and great ideas and so the procurement rules are, are really designed as almost as barriers to entry for little guys with good ideas and they kind of protect the status quo. Yeah, just to, so to sum up to the huge difficulties we outlined in the book, one is the civil service rules and how difficult it is to hire and bring in people, secund them from private industry, let them go back out. The other one is procurement mm -hmm. and all these rules were set up for good reasons 100 years ago by reformers who wanted to make sure that the process was clean, nepotism didn't operate, but then like like kudzu, they just they just grew, and their original reason for being what has been forgotten, and it's now the rules for the rules' sake. So we're both pretty emphatic about the need for reform of these rules, and hoping that all of you will do it. And it's an issue that's, that, that people are getting more and more excited about. Uh, and folks like Clay Johnson and others oh, yeah. are trying to tackle from the private sector with, yep. uh, with their companies. Let's go on the back, yes, right here. Uh oh. I want to know about how this model will work at the moment. When we were talking about this, this, this post-2015 refugee process pushing for the post-2015 uh, sustainable development goal process yeah. pushing for inclusive cities, um, participatory inclusive Could you talk just a little louder? Oh, we're just having trouble understanding. Okay. Um, I want to know how... <laughs> okay. My questions are, how would this model work at the global level when we're discussing the uh, up and coming post-2015 sustainable development goals process and this new um, outlook about creating inclusive cities? They have a whole goal dedicated to this. Um, it's about participatory inclusive planning. And I'm just wondering, is this model being considered or is it being pushed at the global level? Because uh, network polity is becoming very popular and I'm just wondering um, how the role of civic data analysis can become recognized and how it can push global, the global digital divide. I'm asking this because I work with a coalition of grassroots women's networks that are trying to get grassroots women's groups um, to, to better engage with civil, I'm uh, sorry, to better engage with local government to um, participate in inclusive planning. So has this been considered in your uh, work that's what I was going to ask. <laughs> Excellent, Rich. I appreciate that. Um, so this is all at a, a sort of uh, early stage around the world. Um, 
and there was an open data movement that became a real global force, but it was a little bit of a faddish development in a sense because it didn't lead to enough change in people's lives. Now we're seeing the next step, which is all the things we're writing about in the book, using data to understand it, to know what a city knows, and there are mayors across the globe sharing best practices along these lines and thinking about engagement. In particular, um, in Rio, uh, the, that became a, a sort of center of smart city activity with the World Cup and uh, you know, the Olympics showing up in Rio. And uh, we write about in the book the mayor being equally interested in supporting uh, groups in the slums above the city of Rio who wanted to build what they called digital agoras to help uh, citizens be engaged in the planning of facilities for the slums and to give them very high connectivity, you know, relationships with data. Uh, so there's more and more of this idea of trying to help more people be engaged in uh, the development of, of a responsive and healthy city, but we're at a very early stage. So that's the answer. Lots of people, cities are very chic these days, we're all talking about cities. Um, but uh, not enough is happening that really joins the engine of grassroots organization with the people of goodwill behind the walls of City Hall. So because Rich did such a good job catching the microphone, um, <laughs> what is the next question? So you mentioned at the beginning that this is all happening at the city level. Mm -hmm. Is there something inherent that the federal government or even the state governments are too big to be able to really be responsive and engage? And how does that play out in the long run? Does power shift from federal or state to local? Yeah. And what does that mean? It's a great question. John, you want to field that one? Um, I can tell you that there, there's a lot of really good stuff happening at the federal level. Uh, I have less experience at the state level. Um, one of the great pieces of advice I got when I, when I went in was don't try to do everything yourself. Um, what you want to do is find the other people who are already there, who already believe and feel and think about the same things and create, create a group, create a movement. And uh, I think that is happening. I think um, it gets overshadowed by a lot of the politics at the federal level. Um, and I think uh, I, would, I would agree with maybe one of your statements uh, in that question, which is that I do think the cities right now are, are a prime place to get things done, specifically because of the gridlock that's happening at the federal level. Mm -hmm. And um, hopefully that won't stay that way forever. But right now, it does seem like cities are, are where it's at. Yeah, um, you know, there's, there's good and bad things happening at each level of government. I think one, at the city level, you know, cities are place-based organizations and, and people live in their places and they take, they take concern about those places and so they're likely to engage with the city first of all. But in addition to that, you know, the mayor or the agency director is is involved much more in kind of retail government than they are at the state or federal level. And, and I think the more you're involved in actually dealing with somebody that is in your community, the more likely you are to be able to kind of break through some of these barriers. So I think the leadership showing at the, at the local level. The state level, I think, will get there. The problem is you need a, you need a, uh, a, a governor who is, so states are, with the exception of New York City, states are big places with lots of employees and lots of agencies. And so somebody has to be at the executive level uh, uh, passionate enough about a cause and knowledgeable enough about the power of data to put them together to drive change. And that's not often, not always the formula in state government, right? Just big, you have to be Isn't that inherent though that it is retail because it's, it can be responsive, it can engage? Or, well, or it, it, yeah, I'm not sure which the chicken, which is the egg, yeah. but yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Great, so let's, let's move on to a lightning round. Try to get in a couple more questions in the back in green. Lightning round. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we've been talking about big data and cities for about an hour and a half, and race hasn't come up. And I was wondering if you guys could just talk about kind of the unfairness of big data that we've seen in the past, like, you know, since our country was founded. Um, and if you could talk about how that relates to the response to the city and the idea of helping communities when often helping is translated on the ground into just more surveillance. Yeah, well, let me answer the first half of your question on uh, how I'm thinking about data in terms of uh, race and equity in cities, and then Susan may have some comments about surveillance. 
So I think the system pre-smartphone was, was not a very representative system, right? When, back to my child support story, when I represented all the moms who were on welfare, um, you know, the service quality was kind of mediocre, and then the change of the law to have us represent uh, middle class moms, and they started calling in really loudly to the city councilors and others, like these guys don't, you know, they're not interested in their phones fast enough, et cetera. So things started to happen. So people with voice have always had disproportionate effect on government. And so uh, to me now, um, this is a chance actually to cure that problem, not to aggravate it. Uh, we'll get to your surveillance question in a second. But if you said, look, I'm, I'm, in, a, I'm, a, I'm in um Bedford Stuyvesant, and I've got a neighborhood organization. I'm going to be tech savvy. You know, I'm going to take the smart Chicago tools and put them in my community. I'm going to map exactly how long it takes to get a, a fire response, a police response. What are the resources in my community? You know, how often do these things happen? And then I'm going to organize in terms of uh, equity issues so that that stuff is visible and is transparent and it's mapped and it's organized. And, and I just had a discussion with the mayor of St. Paul about can we uh, give folks who are in after school programs, uh, encourage them to tweet back, are, are you, are, you know, is your curriculum make any sense? Is your teacher any good? Do they show up on time? Are they responsive? Or how about workforce training? So to me, the tools, if used right, will help resolve some of the inequities that have built up inherently in those cities. I don't want to be Pollyannish about it, but I think it's an opportunity. But it does leave the surveillance issues and the, and the profiling issues as, as important ones that need to be considered as well. Right, and there the line is often socioeconomic status, right, in, in addition to, or, or really mostly, uh, when it comes to, you can buy your privacy and buy respect and dignity as a, a richer person. You can uh, get more personalized services. You can get special access that's uh, more difficult for people of, of uh, lesser means. So these are huge systemic social problems. I, our hope is that the use of data will reveal these problems, as well as provide some uh, avenues for um, ameliorating them. Right, one more. I think is uh, let's go uh, right here. Last question of the day. Yeah. Uh, this is Sainthani. My question is, I'm from a developing country, and how does your book, or how will it help a developing country cities mm -hmm. in particular? Because we have a dearth of data. Even if data is there, it's not reliable. Mm -hmm. So, so um, we, the, the book doesn't have a, a, a huge number of international stories. Um, I've been doing a little bit of work with the Inter-American Development Bank, and uh, Susan and I have done a, a technical paper for them. And for them, uh, the bank, in providing uh, support services, not financing to uh, Latin American countries, they're trying to look at how um, smartphone and even dumb phone texting uh, can provide uh, a thickening of the relationship between residents and their government, right? So how do they get services? How do they apply for things? How do they find out about information? How do they express themselves? How do they combine in groups to make their views known? So um, I think that the big hope uh, on, the, on that side is not so much big data and predictive analytics. It's the um, restructuring of responsiveness around the use of uh, of the phone itself as an instrument of connectedness. Right, and, and to add to that, the explosion in major cities is happening in India and China, and there is a lot of collaboration across the world uh, between planners who are trying to understand what works best. So this book is a contribution on the American side of uh, tools and techniques. We hope it's useful there as well. Thanks, guys. Excellent. So, okay. Yeah. Um, well, this is the point where I was going to say thank you to everyone here. I also want to thank uh, Matt Stempek right. for doing such an amazing job holding on the floor for our, our hosts here at Microsoft Research. Um, I want to pull up the book one more time. It makes a great, <laughs> great Christmas present, also a great Thanksgiving present, great Halloween present. Just Not a great so much thing. Halloween. Not so much Halloween. <laughs> and finally, thank you to our wonderful authors for joining us. Tonight.